dolphins. They're always watching the sky. They're watching the earth. Um, they're, you know, uh, God speaks to them. And I think a witch was somebody who made omens and portents and signs happen in ways that um, seem to reside inappropriately in a human form. Mm. Uh, witches in Puritan New England were not thought to wear black pointy hats, although they sometimes did ride around on brooms. Um, and they acted in a whole manner of inappropriate ways or were present at times when inexplicable things happened. Mm. Um, small harms, you know, milk curdling, sour, uh, cider going sour, um, big harms, uh, you know, somebody saying, oh, what a pretty child that is, and the child soon sickens and dies. Um, women who spoke out of turn, uh, you know, who whose tongues went on like fishwives in ways that um, really seemed to sort of stick out of the fabric of conversation mm -hmm. at the time. Um, people who said things that later seemed to be ominous. Um, it's a world in which, you know, science is quite primitive and a great deal of what unfolds in any given season is inexplicable, right? Crops fail, animals die. Um, and sometimes in the search for supernatural explanations, um, which included God and the devil, um, which is as the handmaidens of the devil um, were, were faulted. It's hard to see looking backwards whether there were individuals who cultivated that reputation, um, who had uh, sort of family businesses in curative arts that flirted with the edge of uh, of the supernatural, you know, there there are some instances in Salem where um, uh, women are found with poppets that seem to be uh, little little cloth dolls that seem to be used in um, in some kind of ritual. One thing that's quite different in uh, in the early New England witchcraft cases than in uh, a lot of more ancient witchcraft cases is that Puritans are very concerned with the idea that some witches consort with the devil. Um, you know, there's a there's a black mass that surfaces in accounts of Salem that's not typical in run-of-the-mill witchcraft cases um, where it's where it's really more about livestock or about what we would now think of as a nightmare. I woke up with a sensation of somebody pressing on my chest and I thought of my neighbor and it must have been her um, bewitching me. Um, so a whole range of unexpected happenings that didn't have an easy narrative cause that could fasten on somebody who for whatever reason um, stuck out in a fabric of society that was supposed to be smooth. Very, which brings us to the idea of gender, mm -hmm. because when you talk about smooth society, there's orders and rules. Mm -hmm. And there's a quote from George Webb who said, the tongue is a witch. What did he reveal about women's voices or how they were understood in, in the 17th century society when he says that the tongue is a witch? Like, what does that mean? Um, so George Webb is an Anglican cleric, uh, and um, he's one of a, a host of people at that time, uh, reformed Protestants of one kind or another, um, writing about the power of speech um, and uh, and often about the power of women's speech in particular. This is what my first book, Governing the Tongue, was about. Um, Puritans are famously people of the word. Uh, mm -hmm. They are, you know, devotees of the Bible and uh, vernacular language. They take utterances very, very seriously. There are over a hundred kinds of speech crime policing the boundaries of proper speech in Puritan New England. Everything from a child cursing a parent was technically a capital crime because it was a violation of the Fifth Commandment, um, speaking against authority in various ways, slander, defamation, um, scolding, railing. And uh, an, a significant number of speech infractions um, ways of, of speaking out of turn 
hung on women in particular, the idea of, of the scold as a female figure, um, the railer as a female figure, um, was, uh, was old in England and was highly salient, uh, in early New England. So, um, when I was, when I was doing my research on speech in New England society, um, I focused on cases not just in Salem, but in the long run of New England witchcraft from the 1640s forward, where um, some of what neighbors said about people accused of witchcraft was um, ways in which they had spoken out of turn. Um, women who were women who were saying things that they shouldn't have or in places they shouldn't have, in tones that they shouldn't have. Um, a woman's role in Puritan society uh, was a vitally important role, um, but it was a vitally important role in a in a marital partner uh, in a marital partnership um, as a help meet. Um, mm. You know, a, uh, a it's what what would now in evangelical rhetoric be called a complementarian philosophy. Um, uh, you know, the sort of uh, yin to the husband's yang. Women who weren't married were anomalous. Um, you know, there's a there's a significant number of women accused in Salem who are either um, post married or unmarried in uh, in some way. So a helpmeet who was a crucial partner in a marriage and in a household, but also the junior partner, the non speaking partner, the partner who didn't serve on juries or vote um, because male house headship was thought to cover everybody in the house, um, and that interest was assumed to be indivisible. Um, there are definitely suspects in Salem who rise to community notoriety because the husband and wife are fractious against each other. Um, so uh, there were, I guess, the the channel for the virtuous woman um, was a pretty narrow channel. Um, at the same time, and this is something other scholars have dealt with as well, um, women had enormous generative power in society, right? That if you're if you're a uh, if you're a society that's unraveling mysteries, the mystery of birth is is profound, right? Um, and is the the sort of rootstock of society. Um, so uh, one thing that witches are often accused of is processes that um, that interrupt generation in one way or another. Um, things that are supposed to come to fruition that misfire. Mm -hmm. um, uh, another scholar, Carol Carlson, uh, out at University of Michigan, found um, that uh, a significant number of suspects in New England witchcraft cases were women who had unusually direct lines to property holding, either because they didn't have living husbands or they didn't have sons or they didn't have brothers, some unusually direct relationship to property and land. Um, uh, John Demos, in his great work, Entertaining Satan, tracked the number of female witchcraft sub, uh, suspects who were postmenopausal, who were through their childbearing years, so who had completed their great function in Puritan society, um, but nevertheless persisted in ways that were um, uncomfortable or could get uncomfortable for, um, for their uh, fellow townsfolk. About four out of five witchcraft suspects in New England was female, so way outscale for the uh, proportion of the population. And when we look at the percentage tried and the percentage executed, um, the predominance holds. I'm thinking of the, uh, the story of uh, Mary Webster and Hadley in the, I think the 1680s. She was accused of witchcraft, taken to Boston and was acquitted and brought back. But, you know, the complaints were what you'd expect. She was she was cranky. She spoke mm -hmm. out for herself. She wasn't religious. Um, and and there, there's a, one of the themes that's popped up in all of the interviews we've been doing is that there's this, what seems to be the the tight normal focus on suspects at the start, you know, the, the typical other mm -hmm. Sarah Good, Sarah Osborne, um, and obviously a slave, Tituba. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Sarah Good was, a, as you said, she was a mumbler. She mm -hmm. was a, she would she would mutter things under her breath. Corn and, cob pipe, exactly yeah. right. She didn't fit those norms, and, and that bothered people. 
but but then that circle starts to get wider and you you start to get people like uh, Rebecca Nurse and uh, Martha Corey and what, do you have a uh, your own view on why that circle started to move outside of the normal others and move on to people you wouldn't expect I mean some of these were covenant members of the church um, and, and it starts to spread in a way that you wouldn't expect does that seem to still follow these rules of women should be behaving one way, but now they're not? Or I, you know, I think one of the reasons we keep keep going back and back and back to Salem, um, which um, I, I don't have the numbers at the tips of my fingers, but I think it's it's under ten percent of the people who are accused of witchcraft in the in the seventeenth century in New England. Right? Mm -hmm. It's a it's a spasmodic incident. It's not the only. Uh, it's not the only spasm. There's uh, there's one in Hartford. There are other you know there are other right. clusters. But the reason we keep going back and back and back to Salem is because of the ways that it jumps the tracks. Mm -hmm. um, it goes outside of uh, the normal abnormal witchcraft suspects. Um, there are a higher proportion of men suspected and uh, and uh, tried and even executed in Salem than there are elsewhere at other times in the colonies. And it goes goes up and up and up the social spectrum, touching eventually even the governor's wife mm -hmm. herself. Um, and that's one of the reasons that people have looked so intensively at the structure of that community, um, the instability in church headship that we see both in Salem Town and Salem Village, where that covenant community is fervent in the way that many New England towns are, but is also repeatedly rocked by ministers coming and going. Um, some of the military upheaval and economic upheaval that we see in the 1680s, the political upheaval um, around Massachusetts's response to uh, England's overreach in the dominion of New England that results in the revocation of the first charter. So um, it's an, it's a, a, a volatile place at an unstable moment. Um, we know from Mary Beth Norton's work that there are also particular uh, familial connections between the traumas that are inflicted by the uh, Indian Wars, the, the, the sort of backcountry frontiers of Britain's imperial wars um, in the Northeast. It's it's overdetermined the reasons why um, that community would be at risk in various ways, um, and yet still uh, there's enough there's enough mystery in it, right? You could do a control. Well, what are all the what are all the places that have similar instability, and um, and why does you know why aren't you know why isn't there a, a a massive witch hunt in New Haven at the same time, or mm -hmm. um, uh, it's certainly not that people in Salem are less learned than they are other places. Um, their leadership is um, is lacking, right? That that they have hindsight is always twenty twenty. Um, you know, looking back, if you had had a minister unlike Samuel Paris, who had chosen to preach on peace and love and quiet the flames rather than to um, pour, it wouldn't have been gasoline for them, but, you know, pine tar on a, on a smoldering set of embers, mm -hmm. um, you could have had, uh, you could have had a different outcome. You can think of people who could have intervened all along the way to say, but wait, isn't this God telling us to love one another? Or, um, you know, isn't this uh, a call for um, the greatest of these is, is love or charity? Um, should we look to this scripture instead of that scripture to guide us? Um, I don't think even Samuel Paris thought from week to week, oh, if I do this this week in two weeks, it's really going to get going. Um, it's a it's an interesting instance of how, um, without I think, without any concerted malign action, um, good people failing to um, to to step up um, can result in a kind of conflagration. Um, 
so a conflagration only related to its time and place, right? It's it's hundreds of people, not thousands of people who are drawn into its web. Although um, that conflagration is large enough and is late enough in the history, the long history of European and Anglophone witchcraft, that it sticks out almost immediately, right? That by 1693, um, you have people knowing that Salem is a is a black eye mm -hmm. um, uh, for for the whole New World experiment that New England is going to be called New Witchland is one of the first things that's um, that's said ex post facto about it and um, people continuing to write about it in the you know in the 1740s in the era of the American Revolution it very quickly enters the domain of metaphor. Why was why was the the slave woman Tituba's testimony so powerful to this community? I, I would I mean my my looking back yeah. tw you know twenty first century attitude is well she she seems to be so far of an outsider that she shouldn't have a voice at all and yet here she is and it seems to matter so much why do you think that was I think um, I I will answer your question particularly about Tituba I think what you've just said hangs over the whole of Salem in general, right? Like, why are the most powerful men in the Western Hemisphere listening to these girls in their teen years and their early 20s? There's a whole flipping of whose word counts and whose doesn't. I, I think Tituba's speech, at least as we have it come down to us, you know, through a court clerk's hand who's um, probably... Uh, to some degree over exoticizing her dialogue, her dialect. Um, it's just incredibly vivid, right? Mm -hmm. You know, that she, uh, she decides, um, you know, possibly tactically in some way, oh, you want a witch? You know, here's, you, you've told me to sing like a canary. I am going to sing in the song of the tropics. It's going to have it had just if you just looked through Tichaba's speech for mm -hmm. the color, mm -hmm. um, you know the the birds, the tawny man. The um, uh, it's a scholars have studied. Um, there seems to be some fusion of what she must have picked up of um, New England lore, which in Paris's household she would have had abundant access mm -hmm. to. Um, she must be hearing him walk around practicing his preaching even before he's doing it. Um, and what she's brought with her, we think, from Barbados. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you could have called central casting for somebody to make the riveting intervention in a drama and not have conjured up somebody who could do so with more elan than she winds up doing. Um, at, at other points in New England jurisprudence, I think it would have been quickly relegated to the side. Like yeah. just, just uh, it, it doesn't follow... It doesn't follow conventions, right? Um, uh, there's a lot of leading the witness. Um, is there this? Yes, there's that. And let me give you a little more. Um, she plays her role very well. And um, it's it's interesting, I think, unknowable, ultimately. Um, one of the things that happens in Salem is the conventions of witchcraft trials and jurisprudence flip to some degree. So um, in 1660 in Boston, if you had made a heartfelt confession of your involvement uh, in witchcraft, that would have perhaps yielded you absolution in the world beyond, but what it would have yielded you in this world is death. Mm -hmm. um, in Salem, confession liberates people from the noose. And um, she can't know that yet when she's testifying. She's testifying too early. Um, you know, it may be that what she says is so narratively compelling that she begins to set that pattern in motion. Um, but that's one of the many things that goes topsy turvy in Salem. We're listening to people we're not supposed to listen to, um, and kinds of utterances that would get you killed 
10 years before um, make you uh, a sort of star of the confessional circuit in 1692-93. Well, and you mentioned the girls, the you know the afflicted accusers who are there at the front of the meeting house and they're you know going into convulsions and and that it's odd that they too are being listened to, you know, as opposed to the grown adults in the mm-hmm. room, right? Is there a, a nuance to that, or is is it just more of the same? It's just more of the conventions being flipped on its head. I, you know, I think that is to me the great mystery of the Salem proceedings is how, in a world that devalues women's utterances and that tends to keep um, maybe especially young women within their channels, uh, this group of um, Adolescent—that's an anachronistic term—but um, women in their teens and early twenties um, come to be this this sort of star witness coterie um, is is completely ineffable. Um, I think there is pretty convincing evidence that they are to a certain extent coordinating with each other and engaging in deliberate fraud. Um, This is what uh, the scholar Bernard Rosenthal believes that, um, uh, you know, you you can't, a a pin doesn't come out of nowhere, right? Um, It's a, there's a kind of stagecraft to what they're doing um, that in the normal run of, Puritan punishment and social sanction uh, should land them in the stocks uh, in either private or public shaming, right? Um, either chastening in their families or by their congregations, um, or punishment for scolding and raillery and speaking against their betters, right? The the speaking out of fifth commandment order, the younger against the older, um, women against men, women against ministers in some cases um, with George Burroughs. So how that happens, you know, it it seems like a moment where um, the normal sources of authority hold so poorly and the need for answers to questions that seem profound um, feels so urgent that um, people begin listening to unexpected witnesses who say they have answers. Yeah, it's so out of it's so out of the ordinary when you have magistrates, you know, the the judicial rulers who are also the business rulers, and they're from families that have been cultural and social, you know, patriarchs. But they, they're the leader in every aspect of life, and yet they're deferring to these children in a sense you know tell me tell me the truth right i mean they they wouldn't have seen themselves as deferring right they would have seen themselves as using these female youths as the conduit to um you know scouring into the marrow of god's mm-hmm. justice um but if you look even a handful of years before Um, There's a possession case in Massachusetts, the case of Elizabeth Knapp, which uh, John DeMoss writes about at length. She's a a young female servant in a minister's house and um, undergoes many of the same kinds of um, traumatic manifestations that the afflicted accusers do in Salem, including, um, you know, saying vile things to the to the minister, maybe even speaking in a voice that sounds like um, uh, a voice not her own. And, you know, the 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 seal is put on the box really fast. You know, mm-hmm. she is uh, she's possessed, um, not afflicted not a witch herself and uh we're gonna we're gonna get her cured and nobody's gonna listen to her for heaven's sake you know nobody is gonna listen to her we're gonna get her the help that Mm -hmm. she needs um which in our time would be some kind of psychiatric intervention and in their time is a religious one um that's that's a moment and a happening that's extremely close in both time and place, right? It's not, I think it's not a full 10 years before. I think it's the 1670s. I think it's actually 1672. It's Willard, right? We're talking it's about Willard Samuel and, Willard. Yeah. I think it's 20 years before, but Willard 
has his own connections to yeah. Salem as well. Yeah, but Willard is a skeptic. I mean, Willard oh, yeah. is a thoroughgoing skeptic. Um, I think Willard is one of the people who represent a kind of um, secularizing is too strong, but who represent a kind of cosmopolitan urbanity mm -hmm. um, that is nibbling at the edges of Salem. I, I did a piece of work at one point that I never published um, about the image of the devil's book in the Salem witch trials. You know, what does it look like? Oh, it's, it's you know, it's small and they hide it and it's red, it's not red. Um, and looking at the book trades in New England at the time where, um, you know, this is a moment in the late 1680s and early 1690s where small secular print materials, um, you know, histories, geographies, satires, joke books, playing cards um, are coming into the bookstores in the port cities. And um, are undermining the kind of unitary authority that ministers who had less of the urbanity that Willard uh, happened to have um, yeah. had experienced before. Um, at the same time, Increase and Cotton Mather, um, who were fundamental to Salem unfolding the way it did, were also part of that urbane world. You know, Cotton Mather was a fellow of the Royal Historical Society. Um, you know, was a was a uh, fancied himself a scientist of international connection. Um, so it's not education or intellect that explains where people came down and mm -mm. and how. Because Cotton Mather at the same time would publish works collecting supernatural occurrences and and treat them in that sort of scientific and historian-minded view of, well, here's this thing that happened, and let's, let's not do that. Um, right. Well, I mean, this is a world in which um, science and religion and um, ghost stories all are, are very much of a piece. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I've been reading in the last week or so the first – volume of Deborah Harkness's All Souls trilogy, which is called A Discovery of Witches. Hmm. Um, I started reading it, bec you know, I, th I thought, I had thought, these are books about witches and vampires. This is not something I'm going to read. And I did a panel with her a couple of weeks ago. She's an early modern historian of science. And she said that the conceit of the books was, what if the world actually works the way that people thought it did in the 15th and 16th and much of the 17th century. And I thought, that's a great conceit. Um, you know, they had a they had a particular cosmology, parts of which we believe we have proved wrong. Mm -hmm. um, we also have a cosmology, right? That there are certainly things in our conceptions of science, our totalizing conceptions of science, that people in 200 or 300 years will wonder, how on earth? earth did they believe that? How did they think, you know, this is something that we're already starting to question. How did they think that bombarding the body with poison was going to cure cancer, right? I mean, you, I, one of the things that we can take from a Salem into the present day are, what are the things that we believe ardently and with the backing of all of our um, scripture and science and, uh, and learning that are just going to be revealed as wrong. Mm -hmm. So yes, science and magic and uh, omens and portents and a message in every eclipse would have been true for Mather, you know, who lives on the edge of the world of Newton. Absolutely. Side note, what I love about Elizabeth Knapp's story is that she moves on and she marries a man named Samuel Scripture. That's sort great. Of a, well, how can I redeem my my name as best as I can? His last name is Scripture. That's we'll go great. With that. Yeah, That's I think he was the, yeah. the slave next door. In your book, Governing the Tongue, you argued that witch hunting was uh, in part a policing of speech. Well, young me said that. I don't know whether old <laughs> me would say that. So um, 
was witch hunting in part a policing of speech? I mean, I, I think that um, the ways that social norms are policed is that there are a set of consequences when um, when people overstep or um, or misspeak, and um, the you know most witch hunting is informal, right? Um, so saying to a neighbor. Um, or complaining in church, or taking to court an accusation that um, that somebody has uh, done something to make you very uncomfortable, and that something gets the name of witchcraft, um, is a way of enforcing norms. I want to shift over to the courtroom, well, the meeting house at least. This, you have this unique thing happening in the first examination with Sarah Good and Sarah Osborne, how their husbands are brought in and give testimony against them. Um, and it, it might be coerced out of them. They might be freely giving it. I'm I'm not sure. But uh, how would their testimony against their wives have have matched up with, I guess, expectations for the Puritan husband? You know, the the type of role that they're supposed to have. You know, would this kind of testimony against a spouse have been unusual in a courtroom? Um, I think that the goal of Puritan a goal of Puritan religion and a goal of jurisprudence in uh, a place like Massachusetts where it's an inquisitorial system, not an advocacy system. Um, so the goal of a proceeding is to get to the truth, not to defend one side against the other. Um, I think those are instances where the charges at hand and the testimony of neighbors had made people questioned the behavior of those they lived with intimately, and it would have been expected in the community that they would come forward with their doubts. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's um, there's a unity of husband and wife as a um, as a political person, as an economic person. Um, but I think um, you know, in spiritual matters like that, if there, um, if there is a need to delve into error, um, you know, they, I think they don't realize at that moment that they're on the leading edge of a mortal battle that's going to encompass scores and then hundreds of people and, and bring all the towns around it. Um, you would have joined the court in uh, trying to get to the bottom of a search for error um, in a perfect world. I mean, in a, you know, um, I haven't done the research to be able to say husbands in X percentage of cases would demure when asked about, um, about their wives' indiscretion. But um, in theory, that's the way jurisprudence in an inquisitorial system should work. Mm -hmm. And and when brought before magistrates or whether we're talking, you know, the meeting house kind of village trial or we go to Oyer and Terminer where things get very serious, is there a difference in gender with how people are represented? I'm just thinking about, about the dynamics of gender when a suspect or an accused is brought into the courtroom. Is it different for a man or a woman? Well, I think um, the situation's in a place like 17th century Massachusetts, where a woman would have been called upon to speak publicly and officially for herself are, are extremely few. Hmm. Um, uh, you know, there's a pretty lively debate in Puritan meeting houses about whether women should narrate their own conversions. Um, you know, when they're, when they're, uh, ex you know, when they're describing how they experienced indwelling grace to become full members of the congregation. And um, some, uh, as I recall dimly when I did this work on 17th century New England, um, some ministers preferred to take those narratives in longhand um, or in chambers in some way to having a woman come in and profess openly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, famously in New England, Anne Hutchinson in 1636, not all that long ago, right, from 1692, uh, is banished from the colony for um, preaching to mix audiences. Um, you know, women, women in uh, conventicles that did Bible study 
woman on woman, um, women in birthing chambers, women in um, household working groups would have had, you know, very free speech in front of each other. But the number of times that you would call uh, a female speaker to depose herself in any official proceeding would be um, would be you know pretty rare. Mm -hmm. uh, a defendant in a court trial. Um, a witness sometimes in a court trial, a jury person, never a preacher, never um, a, a political candidate or giver of a political opinion, never um, a poet on occasion, right? Anne Bradstreet has published her poetry in England and it has come back and been republished in New England by the time that Salem uh, breaks out and um, speaks in those poems, God, those beautiful poems, um, mostly on the combination of domestic and spiritual matters, but takes up even in poetry the question of, um, am I obnoxious? to each carping tongue who says um, a woman's hand better a needle than a pen fits. Um, so this, this, you know, this question of speaking out loud, writing out mm -hmm. loud beyond the domestic context, it would have been an extraordinary scene. Well, you know, it's interesting. We were, um, we were at the, the Peabody Institute Library in Dammers talking to Richard Trask, and he has a number of things in the vault, mm -hmm. one of which is the, um, he has the minister's notebook which you can watch things such as the handwriting of Samuel Paris degrade over eight months, you know, from neat and clean to he's just trying to get everything on the mm -hmm. page. But there's the church notebook as well. And evidently after Reverend Green came in and took over for, for Reverend Paris, um, Ann Putnam, one of the accusers, one of the afflicted accusers, wanted to become a member in the church and had to confess, you know, and apologize because so many people in that congregation have been affected by her words. And so there's this large book that we can still open up. I mean, he opened up the page mm -hmm. right to us. And and her confession has been written out by Reverend Green, not by her. It's but it's been mm -hmm. it's been recorded longhand, like you said. And then there's her signature that's hers. It's in a different hand. So he just hands her the the pen and she she signs her name. Does well, she probably couldn't that? have written anything of that degree of elaboration, right? So um, reading and writing are separately taught skills okay. at the time. Um, and uh, women in, in Puritan New England have an unusually high level of reading literacy um, because it's thought to be so important for everybody to be able to read the Bible and for mothers to be able to read the Bible to their children. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but they have a pretty low level of what's called sign literacy. Um, so she can sign her name. She has some rudimentary um, written literacy, but probably not the fluency to write an entire document. I guess one of the things that I find fascinating about that um, uh, post hoc confession around Salem, I mean, uh, so people remember, right, how what a, what a terrible uh, scar on the community it's been and her role in it. Um, but she's kind of able to sew it up and resume a normal life. If I recall correctly, she goes on and marries. Um, you know, you, you would think that you would have um, a sort of lifelong stain on your reputation and on the informal um, economy of the marriage market, um, you know, social life, your ability to uh, speak kindly to your neighbor and, and vice versa. Um, and, um, I, you know, I think some of them remain unmarried, but not in a not in an extreme proportion. Um, mm -hmm. So the ability, and, the, and this is Puritanism as it's supposed to work too, right? The ability to make a heartfelt repentance and, um, and go on in forgiveness. No matter how big the, <laughs> right? No matter how big the mess up was. We tend to look back at Salem and kind of snicker at them for their obsession over witchcraft and things like that. But how, Monty Python. Yeah. Right. right? Yeah. Um, but how different are we today? Well, I mean, we're, um, we're at a moment where I think we're looking for others under every rock, right? Um, we're, we're acutely sensitive to, um, uh, 
to threats from the outside to American civilization, whatever that is. Um, I think we're, uh, we're an extremely tribal moment in American politics and public life. Um, uh, I'm, you know, I think we're at a moment where it's pretty easy to see how the wheels come off the bus of society, right? Um, and to begin wondering about questions like, how does a community heal after a period of um, mutual recrimination, profound upheaval, uh, shifts in the dynamics of power that seem unpredictable and anomalous in the uh, in the span of history that you can look at closely with the tools that you have to look. Um, you know, what will our um, confessions and uh, um, reconciliation look like? Um, I think one of the things that makes Salem so perennially interesting um, that brought hundreds of thousands of people to um, the the sort of makeshift um, memorial that was created for the 300th anniversary in 1992. Um, I hope one of the things that brings them is a humility around how close to the surface such moments of spasmodic intolerance are. It's easy to feel smug, right? You know, how do I know she was a witch? She turned me into a newt. Um, I got better, right? Um, it's, it's easy to... Um, uh, to put them in high hats and um, shoes with buckles and, and put it in the back then. Um, I think one of the reasons that we come back and back and back to it after three centuries is because um, the idea of, of such, of, of the danger of society tearing itself apart, um, being so close to the surface, mm -hmm. um, is, it's a perennial. Absolutely. If there's one thing that you hope people can walk away from, um, sort of the takeaway, you know, as as you learn about the whole experience, what is there a lesson there? For yeah, us? I mean, I the the um, the lesson that I think a lot of popular history misses, and that calls for humility and empathy in all of us, is that many of the accusers, especially as um, uh, many of the accused. <laughs> That many of the accusers, as the um, conflict ripples from beyond Salem Village, eventually to bring in the great minds of of Boston and New England, um, these are the best minds of their generation, right? Um, these are the most educated, the most advanced thinkers and scientists, um, uh, the philosophers who have access to the latest findings and ways of thinking morally and ethically, acting morally and ethically in their universe. Um, they cannot be laughed off. Um, you know, they are the, the smartest, uh, most privileged people of their times confronted with uh, something that is awful to them. And they act in ways that come to seem, even within a couple of years, um, almost miraculously terribly. Um, and yet they do it with the best of intentions and the sharpest of tools. If that doesn't encourage a kind of radical humility, um, and uh, second guessing and, um, uh, you know, checking in with each other about who's doing what to when, whom, why, um, I don't know what does. So that's, that's the thing I think is easiest to miss. Hey folks, it's Aaron here. I hope that today's interview helped deepen your understanding of everything involved in the Salem Witch Trials. But we're not done yet. We've got more interviews to share with you. So stick around after this brief sponsor break to hear a preview of next week's interview. I'm Stacey Schiff. I'm the author of The Witches, um, a narrative history of what happened at Salem, to which I came because I was surprised by how little most of us really know about what happened in 1692. Um, the Salem witch trials seem like a shorthand, but none of us 
really understands to what it is a shorthand. Um, I had written a book about Cleopatra before this, and it was the same kind of dynamic of just a name that a name brand, something that everyone recognizes without really having any grasp of the actual history. Well, when you talk about the misunderstanding, it, it, the, I think the place to start here is almost the most obvious question. What was a witch in 1692 Salem? And you're right. That's the question over which we stumble because our definition, the 21st century definition of a witch, is not the 17th century definition of a witch. So, so a witch at the time, witchcraft is a biblical construct, and a witch at the time has a concrete reality because she's mentioned in the, he or she is mentioned in the Bible. And a witch is understood to be any figure, male or female, but primarily female, who is in league with the devil and who works his or her magic by means of little imps or a menagerie of little animals who can do his or her bidding. Um, and that was something that was imported to the colonies from England. It was an extremely rampant, it was an extremely common concept in the, in the old world and actually throughout the old world. Although by 1692, the idea of witchcraft has pretty much fallen out um, in Europe. The colonies are in a little bit of a time warp of their own, and they haven't quite got the message that this, this the witchcraft concept is a little antiquated by now. Um, but you see it throughout the colonial record. There are witches really from the very beginning of New England. And the only difference with 1692 is, that, um, is the prosecution, is that you get this um, feverish set of accusations and you get a relentless prosecution. In earlier cases, um, there had been tremendous leniency. Often someone who brought in a charge of witchcraft was accused of lying and was sent home with a whipping. Um, things were not necessarily taken seriously. And in 1692, obviously, the opposite happens. Going back to these differences in our perception, there's how we imagine it to be and there's the reality of it. How do some of the common symbols of witchcraft that we have today, like flying on a broomstick or black cats, connect with the Salem Witch Trials? Or do they? One of the one of the most interesting to me pieces of this is how the flight gets into um, the entire panic, the entire delusion in 1692. There had not been... Um, there had not been flying witches in New England before 1692. Um, and it would seem, and there were not flying witches in English witchcraft either. So this is really a, an import from the continent. And it would seem that we get that idea um, from a narrative that Cotton Mather, one of the most influential ministers at the time, includes in an earlier text of his. And he writes about a, a Swedish witchcraft epidemic in which a little girl um, is on her way to a satanic meeting. Two, two young children, in fact, set off this witchcraft crisis. And a little girl falls off her broomstick. He writes about all these wonderful details, which we will then see transposed to Massachusetts. But he writes about things that had never before happened in New England, a satanic meeting um, in a meadow at which people sign satanic pacts and to which they fly on sticks. Um, and that is really, there were French, flight, fl French flying witches before 1692. There had never really been English flying witches. So that's pretty, that pretty much seems to be where that aspect of it comes from. Black cats, I spent a lot of time, I live with a black cat, so I spent a lot of time on black cats. And they seem to have been the devil since antiquity. They've, they've had a bad rap all along. And if you look at the Salem testimony, the court testimony, you see a tremendous number of cats. There are translucent cats, there are gleaming cats, there are black cats, there are red cats, they're all over the place. And it, 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 does, it does seem to be it's a seductive creature. It's a female-seeming creature to many, many people's minds. And a black cat will detach itself from the darkness without any warning. And, it's un and a cat is unpredictable. So there's that sense that you can caress a cat and be rewarded with scratches. And all of those things seem to add up to something that people are very uncertain about and often taken aback by. So I, there, there are many number of theories as to how black cats get, get wrapped up in the witchcraft. But yes, that is a constant from day one. This episode of Unobscured was executive produced by me, Matt Frederick, and Alex Williams, with music by Chad Lawson and audio engineering by Alex Williams. The Unobscured website has everything you need to get the most out of the podcast. There's a resource library of maps, charts, and links to Salem document archives online, as well as a suggested reading list and a page with all of our historian biographies. And as always, thanks for supporting this show. If you love it, Head over to applepodcasts.com slash unobscured and leave a written review and a star rating. It makes a huge difference for the show's growth. And as always, thanks for listening.